I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, it's o'clock in Europe and 11 o'clock on the east coast of the US. We are getting started on time. Uh, this webinar is entitled Radio Labeling Techniques in Preclinical Drug Development and being presented by uh, Dr. Olivier Raguin. The fact, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Chris Vitrouille and I'm a business coordinator at Oncodesign. I'll be your host uh, for this webinar. First, a uh, couple of practical matters. Uh, this webinar uh, will be available to all our attendees today. We will email you a link uh, to, to the presentation by email uh, some, uh, starting sometime next week. Uh, Director of the presentation, our presenter, Olivier Raguin, will answer a few of your questions. So if you have any, uh, feel free to type them in the control panel that you see on your screen. If you, uh, if you have, uh, if you have, if you have, uh, pop, 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 pop. I'm lost. if you have any, please type them in the control panel. Those attendees won't be able to see your questions if you send them directly to me. Uh, if you see the control panel, that's what, that's what I wanted to say. Just on the top arrow, uh, on the top of your screen, and uh, in, the, in case there is a question that cannot be answered by the end of today's session, Olivier will respond by email. And also, if you are experiencing any uh, technical difficulties, uh, please send me a message, uh, and uh, I will be able to assist you. I hope, to, uh, I hope that you enjoy uh, today's presentation. Now, let me introduce uh, Olivier Raguin, our speaker today. Olivier uh, has been working at Oncodesign for 10 years now. Uh, he attained his PhD from the University of Paris René Descartes in France in uh, biokinetics of tracers in radio pharmaceuticals. Since his arrival at Oncodesign in 2005, Olivier has played an important role in the development of the radio labeling research and the secret from technology uh, in the company. He a study director at Oncre Design, working closely uh, with clients and the manager to do the most appropriate study design and to survive intro and in vivo preclinical studies. So that, uh, let's begin the presentation. Olivier will guide you through the slides that he will show you today. Olivier, are you ready to start? Yes, thank you, Christa. So let's start with this presentation dealing with the writing techniques in drug development. During the preclinical phase of the development of a new drug, numerous uh, data has to be have to be gathered to provide the proof of concept and also to help the project to go towards clinical phases. We first to choose the right animal model for the molecule to be tested. We also need to determine the right dose to be given to animals. We also need to assess the efficacy of the new molecule. We may have to measure um, molecule levels in, in different biological matrices to assess pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics um, data. It may also be interesting to pass some clinical trials and um, looking for potential biomarkers for uh, the studied by molecule. Efficacy, target expression, and things like this. So to do all this useful work, uh, labeled molecules and mostly radio label molecules may be of help. Um, to investigate all point tension previously 
non-invasively in the BR of animals, most of uh, invasive mice and rats. And radio labeling is a technique for linking uh, uh, radioactive elements to the um, molecule to be studied. And through this webinar, I am going to show some example of label drugs for um, measurement of biodistribution and pharmacokinetics parameters, evolution of target expression, and all type of modules that can be used as, as biomarker. So um, numerous radionuclides exist, and the properties, the physical properties of, of radionuclides make them attractive to uh, integrate some problems in chemistry, biology, medicine, or biochemistry. Radionuclides have different physical and chemical properties that have to be taken to account the radiolabbing procedure. The table here shows the most commonly used radioisotopes in, in the preclinic phase of the of new drugs. And they are sorted by half-life. And you can see that these half-life range from hour to, to death. Most of them can be used for in vitro experiments, but also for biodistribution experiments and imaging experiments. Note one, I-90, can be used for therapy, but not imaging. This is a table, but um, isotopes are sorted by the, the aging modality. Indeed, two different uh, modalities can be used for imaging um, experiments with radionuclides. SPECT, you have here the four, four examples with flies from six to hours to more than six days and also PET imaging modality, and an example of isotopes with half-lives ranging from one hour to of four days. So when you will have to choose isotope to be used, if you want to do an imaging study, you have to take into account the type of imaging modality. Let's see in detail the two modalities. the first modality, stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography. A red belt molecule is named P for radiopharmaceutical, is injected to man or animals, and at a certain time, you can detect where the, the radiolabel molecule is using a dedicated device. Indeed, during radioactive decay, a photon is emitted. This is this photon that we will be detecting. The, study, the second reality, sorry, it's quite similar. You inject the red label molecule to animals or rats. At the same time, the molecule has reached the target tissue. And during the radioactive decay, two photons are emitted simultaneously, and you will detect the emission of these two photons to be able to have an image of where the radio molecule is. In most of cases, the concern of the radio label molecule in blood is quite low in anomalous range. And here is the table summarizing this main characteristic of the preclinical pre aging devices for SPECT and SPECT. Sensitivity is slower for SPECT, but it's not a drawback. Spatial resolution, which is the minimal distance between two points, so they can be detected 
by system is quite similar, 1.2 versus 1.5 millimeter. High availability. I mentioned quite high with respect. Isotopes are most of them readily available. Quite with respect, mainly because for many years only flu and A18 was available. Between brackets, I mentioned medium because some other increasing in in, in Inter, I would say. Isotope half-life hours today, as we see plus for suspect. Hours for PET, once again, because during 18 to our period was the most available, and now two days with new isotopes. Regarding the delay between injection to addition of images, we can do is early or late after the injection of the radio label molecule. Only images can be acquired with PETs, but now with new isotope, we can also have access to late images. Regarding du dual isotope imaging, meaning doing images with two different isotopes, it's possible with PET, but not with PET. And all images can be quantifies precisely with both devices. So regarding the label the, lab, the radio top survey you have you have chosen, some different approaches are possible. The first one would be substitution or addition reaction, many for iodine or fluorosotops. The second method would be chelation which is done only for radioactive metals. In this case, a chelating legend has to be linked to molecule to be studied. And the last is a new synthesis in which um, a specific uh, locally inserted in the molecule for the radio labeling. When radio labeling a molecule, we may have in mind that this has an impact on the functionality of the of the molecule to be studied. The enzymatic activity if the molecule to be studied is an enzyme. I think for the target case of antibody or fragments or, or, or similar molecules. It's the stability of the radio label molecule, maybe because the label will uh, prevent degradation by a specific enzyme, hiding the site of cleavage. Also, adding radio label on the molecule may have some impact on physical characteristic ionization, meaning the total number of charges, hydrophilic properties, which may have an impact on PK parameters and biodistribution. Once you have radio label your molecule. The controls to be performed as to check that the radioisotope is effectively linked to your molecule. And as the radio label molecule has retained its, bio, its biological activity. I mentioned all possible controls that could be performed, isotonicity, pH, stability, or aperogenicity. Now let's have a, a more deep look into different techniques. We we'll start with iodine isotopes, iodine 123, 24, 25. Iodine isotopes were uh, often chosen because the chemistry is relatively simple, and writing with iodine can be set up laboratory quite easily. Beside iodine-125, readily available and has a 60-day half-life, which allows large flexibility regarding the scheduling and the error of experiments, meaning that you can run molecules radio-labeled experiment for at least two to three weeks. Other isotopes are now available. Iodine 1, 23, and 24. They are easier to handle 
mainly for a radiation safety point of view. Two methods are available for radio labeling molecules iodine. The first one is the iodogen method. You have here the form of this reagent, which is not soluble in water and can be coated on, on the iodination vessel. In the presence of iodine, this reagent will produce iodine plus, which acts with this, which is found on the chain of tyrosine, and the two um, red arrows shows where I will be linked. If rain is run for a sufficient amount of time, you can have two lines on the same uh, group in here. So this technique is usable when you can link the iodine to tyrosine and obtain tyrosine residues are available in the molecule to be studied or not involved in this biological activity. If you can't use the method because you have no tyrosine or tyrosine is involved in biological activity. The method that can be used is the Bolton Hunter method. You have here the structure of the regent with as for tyrosine residues a phenol group on which we first leave iodine, here iodine 125. And a second structure, a second group which is here in the uh, um, green water, which will react with primary amines. So for logical molecule for on the side chain of lysine residues. Here you have an example from the literature in which an antibody was radiolabeled by two different things, iodine-125 and indium-111. We'll see that for indium-111 later. And here's a profile of the time of the antibody with both isotopes in several matches. In blood, the profile is quite similar. You can see that in the spleen or bone, the profile is not similar. So when you have a radiolabel molecule, you may still have in mind that the radiolabel may have an impact on the, of the biodistribution. And the impact is dependent on the radiolabel that was used. From the same authors, you have here the distribution of both of the radio label antibodies with both isotopes in different models, LN cap expressing target and P3, which does not express the target. And if we have a look on the biodiscipline, you have here in DNA, in the oral rectangle, you have here and done in uh, the kidneys with iodine with antibody in both models, here, here, and here. The level like antibody, and you can see that the amount of relevant antibody in kidneys is not the same. In the Helen model, you have in the um, rectangle. The bar shows the distribution in tumors of the iodine-125 antibody. And the gray rectangle here, um, the same model, but the addition of the indium given rabel antibody. So from the source, you, it shows that the distribution is depending on the radio label for the same molecule. Same molecule. 
All isotopes that can be used are mineral with some example, indium-111, gallium, lutetium-177, coal or zirconium. Um, numerous metals, radioactive metals, can be used. They can be used for different poses, by distribution, imaging, or so for therapeutic purposes. However, using metal, you can't directly link them to the molecule to be used. You have to use a, a dedicated molecule, which is called the bifunctional chelating agent. One function is a reactive group that reacts to the biologics, and the reaction is called conjugation or bioconjugation. And the other function it binds the metal during what's called the radio labeling process. This slide, some different chelate agents, DTPA, DOTA, NOTA, here DOTAGA, and the functions that will react with the biological molecule is shown in the green rectangle. In the red, sorry, the green rectangle shows functions that will react on primary amines, so on lysine residues. And here you have an example with an OTA, with a function. It's a rectangle which reacts with H groups, that means on the side of cysteine residues. So here is an example of radiolabeling of trastuzumab with indium-111. The step of the experiment was to link to which is there on the body. The reactive function is there. It's a cyclic carboxyl function. And the run was performed on neural conditions in PBS at 25 degrees. So we think that the, the data was effectively linked to the body using mass spectrometry. You have in blue spectrum for the chief antibody, trastuzumab, and you have in, in red the spectrum for the data conjugated trastuzumab. You have approximately one red, 48,000 the mass of the errant molecule. And you have here between trastuzumab and the trastuzumab a shift of this peak, which which us to say that approximately the average number of dota gap antibodies is 2.6. And I... Uh, it's important to note that it's an average number, meaning that we have trastuzumab with one, two, or three dota gap molecule. And uh, one should uh, use a molecule with less, a less, um, an average number lower than one. Because if as the average is low, then uh, quant uh, um, the proportion of molecule that has no chelating agent is increasing. One step was to radiolabel this molecule with indium-111. This was done at plus 37 degrees in acidic condition pH 5.7. It means that when you are thinking of radiolabbing a molecule, you have to uh, ensure the molecule will uh, and the conjugation or labeling conditions, and will not undergo degradation. Once dota gap was radio labeled, which we checked its functionality in vitro in two kind of two different experiments: immunoreactivity, 
which uh, uh, to see the proportion of and use that was able to bind the target. And if radiolabent antibody was incubated with increasing concentration of cells, and we reached approximately a plateau at 60%, meaning that 60% of molecule has retained the energy to bind the target. We also checked the affinity, which was found to be close to 5 nanomolars, which was suitable for an in vivo experiment. And we have on the spec is recorded from 24 to 72 hours post injection. And you have here the display with a low background in organs. Um, a second experiment that was done was uh, radiolabeling with the same chelating agent and the same isotope of an humanized antibody fragment and wanted to evaluate its distribution in tumor bearing mice. And you have here um, so the time in blood, tumor, kidneys, liver. See that in blood, activity is decreasing quite rapidly. The percent of ejected dose per gram of blood is close to zero 20 hours post injection. And in other matrices, tumor, kidneys, and liver, you can see that you can detect radioactivity in, in, in matrices until 100. 50 post injection. So this is just to uh, to if you need to have access to PK parameters, the best is to, to use a live top so you are sure that be able to detect the radio level molecule in, in, in body of, of animals long period of time. In three, um, um, when you little, you have to choose the method you want to use. You have to choose the killing agent that is the most suitable to the metals, and also to uh, amine the acidic conditions. Okay, here is an example of the literature. And, um, you have is the structure of DOTA. DOTA is the most appropriate injection for ium or one or lutetium 177, for example. But the relabling procedure is run in acidic condition, and in most cases, always you have to heat the reaction mixture to have ium or Lutetium chelated by DOTA. So, if your molecule can't be heated, you shift to another one, another chelating agent, such as TPA. Maybe it's the most appropriate one, but still adequate. Know that if you still have to be in acidic condition from the radiolabbing. The radiolabbing is done at room temperature with still good yield. Another tool now, which is Technetium 111, I, I wanted to uh, talk about this isotope separately. Indeed, this isotope is readily available as produced by a generator. You have a, a, a diagram. And it's to uh, Technetium 99M is due used for the preparation in the clinic of 80 to 90 percent of the radiolabeled molecules that are injected to patients. Chemical entity that is obtained from the generator is TCO4-1, and the drawback with technetium is that its chemistry is not easy. It, it, it starts to be reduced to be used, and this uh, reaction step in needs to presence of etine and toric 
geometry of the reaction is difficult uh, to handle. However, uh, a commercial kit is available, which is the isoline kit. Adding PO4 minus 1, you produce under specific conditions this complex take water and CO and use this complex with a chelating agent to label your molecule. Um, most of the time, the his tag um, is used because this structure is um, commonly used for purification purposes. So you can take the opportunity of the presence of the his tag in your molecule for uh, set up labeling with technetium. M. So, as an example, here's the distribution of uh, radio label darpins. You have a, 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 a diagram with a structure, and uh, which, uh, in that case, we had effectively linked the complex with some to the darpin by two techniques ITLC, which is thin layer chromatography. You have here at position 20 the red pin, and you have at the position 80 no peak that would correspond to free technetium. And this was all checked by size exclusion chromatography, um, radiative detection, and UV detection. And you can, UV detection is in uh, red and in blue radioactivity detection. And in this case, the retention time is the same, showing that lithium is effectively linked to the darpins. So to injection of these darpins, we evaluated their biological activity by two different techniques. On, on the left, you have binding to tumor cells. It's quite similar to what I showed for the uh, radiolabel trastuzumab. But we used three concentration of the radio label uh, darpin, and we, we can see that radioactivity bound to cell increases as the concentration of the radio label darpin increases. And in parallel, we checked the, on the le on the left on the right, sorry, by SRSA, with concentration of the radio label uh, darpin. And what's important is that we adapted the Hellerizer technique to work with um, radioactivity, meaning what we did not do the secondary antibody linked to an enzyme, but once uh, the incubation period with the radioactive darpin ended, we washed the wells and we uh, harvested radioactivity in, in, in the wells with, with uh, NAH. So it means any kind of quality process evaluation uh, assessment, quality control that is uh, in routine for cold molecule can be adapted for radioactivity. And here's an example. We, we radiolabeled um, five different darpins that were injected to mice, and you have their uh, distribution for and 24 hour post injection in tumor and blood, and they showed quite similar distribution pattern. And here is another example. The most interesting is uh, this is that highlighted in, in yellow. And uh, it was a, a DAFI body that was targeting A2 antigen. It was labeled by iodine or technetium. And in that case, also, we can see that the distribution is slightly different. As an example, one hour post injection, a percent of injected dose per gram is uh, for iodine 3.8 percent, 48.2, and if moved to 12 hour post injection, only 0.04 percent for iron 
tooth injection versus 0.4 for technetium. And also, the difference in kidneys, again at 2012 worth, around 4% of injecting dose per gram for the iodine lab body versus around 75% for the technetium radio label antibody. So one, uh, the distribution of the molecule is uh, different depending on the hazard that was used for radio labeling. The isotope that is in, in of interest is fluorine 18. So fluorine 18 is produced via a cyclotron. You have the reaction, usually using H water, and the pictures picture on the right show show uh, a cyclotron, and you can have fluorine 18. Uh, F2 or F. Um, Fluorine is quite useful to label small molecules, and you have here an example of afatinib, which is an inhibitor, uh, kinase inhibitor. And in this example, from the literature, Synthesis pathway of afatinib was slightly modified to introduce the last step, action molecule, harboring fluorine 18, to have the product of fluorine 18 afatinib. Here you have another process slightly different from the other, but the result is the same. It's fluorine 18 afatinib. This uh, molecule was evaluated in vivo in the cells F549 harboring a target tyrosine kinase, and second model HCC827, which was harboring a mutated, the mutated and in both the distribution was uh, small models, the distribution was similar. However, you may not be able to uh, use the specific conditions um, for bodies, many peptides of antibodies as used for small molecules because because sometimes the mixture has to be heated, or because of the juice of, of organic solvents that are, may not be compatible with, with biological molecules. So these molecules usually harbor lysine or, and or cysteine residues, and you have an example of the literature just to show that uh, that are reacting with H2 groups SH group was developed to be able to label viral molecule with fluorine 18. Another possibility is to use LLF uh, uh, um, Indeed, fluorine can strongly bind to AL3+, which is a metal, and so which can make can form complexes with chelating agents. So you have here an example. On the, you have a, a, a pied, which NOTA was linked here. And uh, this uh, NOTA was used to complex atom, then ALS. And this 18 label peptide was injected in mice, and these mice were harboring tumors. And this peptide was used in the case of a pre-targeting technique. You have here the gem that shows how it works. The target expresses two antigen. First, a B-specific antibody 
recovering the antigen and an on the peptide was injected. In a second step, the rabbit peptide was injected and images were acquired. You are here on C on the right record when no antibody, specific antibody was injected. You can, we can see the tumor. And in B, you can see the tumor in that case. The big antibody was injected prior to the injection of the fluorine 18, 18 lab peptide. And it, it's FDG that was done for comparison. So all the procedure I, I have I've shown, I would say, dedicated to um, molecules that are already synthesized. And as they really synthesized, the label will be linked, I would say, randomly in the molecule. And one would be interesting in having a method to label the molecule on specific loci. The new, a new technique, a new strategy exists and called bioautogonal chemistry, or and one is bioautogonal chemistry technique is click chemistry. It is, I would say, in the mid around 2005-6. And it's based on the action of an alkyne function. It's a, um, a triple covalent bond be between two carbon atoms. And the use of a structure harboring uh, an aligned uh, function A N3. And this, when the two molecules reacting, you have the formation of this The advantage of using alkyne and azide function is that they are not reacting usually with a function, uh, I would say chemical function, in the body of living animals. However, first they used copper for a reaction to be catalyzed, but in case of using chelating agent, it may be a problem. So new techniques were developed. It's the same principle being you have either alkyne function, either function, which leads to the, to the structure on the right. And this technique that requires copper. So the orthogonal chemistry has the advantage of uh, offering the possibility to insert in the vectors, the biovectors, the biochemical molecule, for example, a specific linker or a, non, a modified amino acid at a precise site that allows to uh, the tool that will be involved in gradual labbing at a specific site. And then, for in vivo experiments, you have the choice to first do the relabbing on a preset site and in to or to inject the the module harbor site where radio labeling has to be done and injecting in the second step the and the um the the radio the radio labeling will be done in vivo. It's called plating techniques. As a conclusion, we have many possibilities to tell any kind of, of, of drug molecule candidate. Radioing is a sensitive technique that can be used without imaging according to your needs. However, the conditions for the lab I think have to be discussed early in the drug development to choose the most appropriate strategy. To finish, 
was showing the FAMIMATCH consortium. And here is that on the surface that is not one square meter. You have here on design, which has a long experience with distribution, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic experiments, a large panel of, of models for in vivo experiments. You have the cell and the anti cancer center. It's the uh, red surfaces. So, C pharma, which is able to produce fluorine 18. You have Kik, and which is uh, involved in the development of uh, a kicking agent, meaning that you have a large uh, panel of experts near co-design. Thank you all for attending the meeting, and I'm available for any question. OK, thank you very much, Olivier. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I hope that uh, today's audience uh, appreciate this webinar as well. So I have a couple of questions that came up while you were uh, doing your presentation. Um, uh, let's take five minutes to address some of these. Uh, the first one um, came from one of our attendees who wrote um, an antibody for which I want to assess penetration in brain tumors. Do you the, the tumor model to do it using the ticks you described? Um, well. Uh, regarding the model, yes. Uh, regarding um, radiating the molecule for uh, stem brain, I think we take care of not modifying, uh, at least in a, in a large extent, the properties of antibody, uh, mainly if the molecule has to cross the broad brain barrier. So it has to be discussed, but it may be possible. And I think if uh, we have a two hydrophilic radiolabel molecule, maybe this may impair uh, from blood to brain via, uh, through the broad brain power. Thank you very much, Olivier, for this answer. Uh, there is one other question that I would like to raise here. Uh, it's the following one. Uh, I have developed antibody drug conjugates and like to independently label the antibody and the cytotoxic small molecule. Is it possible? Uh, in, in theory, I, I would say yes. Um, if uh, we want to, to do that, uh, we have, may have to think of doing, as I said, the click chemistry to be sure that we can label the molecule on, on, on specific sites. And we may have to uh, have to uh, link one red label to the antibody and one another uh, to um, drug. Um, so this. Uh, this may be possible, but it may be uh, quite quite difficult using uh, the isotope I've mentioned above uh, in the presentation. But in the yes, it, it would be possible, Provi provided as the, the, um, the I would say the size of the radio label compared to the uh, uh, the drug. I would say does not uh, modify. Uh, the, the uh, activity of, of the drug, many if it has to be, uh, if uh, the drug has to be clicked from the antibody to, to be effective. And, and take that the, the rebel would not uh, induce steric hindrance that would uh, prevent the cleavage. Okay, um, so thank you, uh, thank you, Olivier, for this answer. Um, so we get to the last question. Uh, I would like to apologize to anyone whose question could
could not be answered today. It was quite a few technical questions, so we will get back to you uh, via email in the coming days. Um, the last question for you, Olivier, uh, that I have here for the moment is the following one. Uh, could labeling techniques also be used with isotopes that could provide a local irradiation of the tissue? Yes. Um, as I'm in the table at the beginning of the presentation, uh, I-290 can be used or uh, lutetium-170 uh, one, also can be used. And also one isotope I did not mention is iodine-131. But it would be possible, yes. Okay, Olivier. Um, um, I saw one, one question I try to answer is regarding the difference uh, in one slide of uh, action of the molecule depending of its iodine or, or uh, indium. Okay, we, we have a couple of more minutes. You can answer if you want. Okay, to fine. Uh, I would say in, what is usually said is that when you label a molecule, the uh, one of uh, the side product will be iodotyrosine, which cleared from blood via um, the kids. And um, for uh, metals, what was, uh, is usually observed is that uh, it's the amino acid linked to the chelated agent loads the metal. That is, um, the taps in, in cells in kidneys, and once in kidneys, uh, it cannot go uh, out from, from kidney cells. So, cells, sorry. So, in fact, it's due to the modification of, of the uh, amino acid. Okay. Amino okay. acid can be transferred from. Did you receive the questions that I didn't see? Sorry? Did you other questions that maybe I didn't receive that you would like to answer? No questions on your side? Huh. Oh, no. Uh, no, I, I think that, that I try to answer all other questions via email. Okay, right. Then for, for the one that... Uh, um, we may receive in the system uh, in the coming minutes. We will be answering uh, all of them via email. I, I, I want think to <laughs> Okay. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Uh, Olivier and I, we wish you an excellent, uh, an excellent day. Um, bye bye, everyone.